All right. Uh, let me get my screen shared and we will kick things off. Thanks, everybody, for being patient as we work through some technical difficulties of our uh, new in-person space and AV system. So uh, my name is Joe Searcy. I'm the co-host of the Kubernetes Atlanta meetup. Uh, for those in the room, this will be a little bit weird because I'm not standing in front of you, but that's because the AV stuff um, will make it work. Uh, for those of you on the Zoom, thank you again for joining. We're going to try to do all of these hybrid going forward. So um, we are gracious to have some sponsors like SpeedScale and the Georgia Tech ATDC uh, for hosting the physical space here for us. Um, first kind of in-person regular meetup in several years now. So glad to be back at it and see people's faces in person and nerd down on some Kubernetes stuff. Um, now, uh, to get started, uh, one thing we normally like to do, uh, shout out to our other sponsor, Calendly, uh, for sponsoring the Zoom webinar here. Um, as mentioned, SpeedScale and Georgia Tech ATDC as well for the physical space and some of the coordination and speakers. Um, and to the community, thank you guys for showing up, uh, showing out, and uh, hopefully we can keep growing in numbers and keep this thing going. Um, outside of that, we have a normal part of our meetup that we start with that's just kind of um, uh, an introduction, news, things of that nature, what's going on in the community. Uh, but before I jump into that, if there's anybody um, uh, on the call that has uh, any uh, hiring for any positions, if you could please post those in the chat. Make sure to include information on what the job is, um, who you are, and how people can get in contact with you about it. Um, if you have that here in the room, if you're hiring for positions and whatnot, uh, meet up with me at some point and I'll record your information and get it added into our meetup notes that everybody can see in our GitHub repository and whatnot. So um, that being said, we're going to jump into some of the news here. So uh, this section we call this month in Kubernetes, and this is kind of a combination of like the past three months because we haven't been around doing it uh, in the like November, December time frame. So um, we start by the Kubernetes project itself. Uh, we are now in the version 1.30 release cycle, which seems crazy that we're at 1.30 now. But um, so uh, what does that mean? Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, Kubernetes project has these release cycles and it's basically where they take all the enhancements and features and things like that that are up and coming. Um, they have a deadline that they have to be done by. You have to have all the documentation and things like that done. And then they go in and they start cherry picking things and they have all sorts of release tooling that help actually build all of the things related to releasing a Kubernetes release, which is like container images, binaries, uh, Linux uh, packages, things of that nature, um, and a bunch of other stuff. Now we're doing like the S-bombs for security, like bill of materials and all that stuff. So um, it's a long process uh, there. I think there's three releases a year now. There used to be four, but there's three now, uh, thankfully. Um, and so right now we're in production readiness review freeze for that. So uh, no more new features that'll go in uh, um, as of February 1st. Um, so that's the next big milestone for that there. So if you're doing work upstream, make sure you get all your uh, T's crossed and I's dotted for that. Uh, we did have some fixed releases uh, this month uh, for Kubernetes 1.29, 1.28, 1.27, 1.26. Um, I didn't see any notation of major CVEs or anything like that. So this is basically a patch release with um, different little bug fixes and things of that nature. No, no major feature enhancements or things of that nature. Um, the next session is kind of going over promotions, deprecations, CVEs, and PRs of note within the project itself. The fact that I don't have anything listed here for some of these sections doesn't mean that there weren't any promotions or, or things of that nature. Uh, it just means that there weren't any that I felt were big enough to call out here or, or interesting. But one deprecation here is the legacy Linux package repositories. Those are going away this month. So if you have a workflow or a platform internal to your business that is dependent on pre-built Linux uh, packages for like Red Hat or Ubuntu or whatever, um, the the existing URLs of how they were um, downloaded, that's going away. So make sure you read uh, the link here on like what the new method is, what's staying around, what's not. Um, and then so general community news. These are just things that I've seen out and about in the community that seemed interesting uh, to me. So sorry for the bias there. Uh, if there's something else that you might have found interesting, but um, this article here was pretty interesting. Uh, distributed systems horror stories um, around Kubernetes deep health checks. So this is something that I've had numerous conversations with people over the years on. 
um, of like, you know, starting out your Kubernetes journey. And it's like every workload has to have a liveness probe and a readiness probe and whatnot for it to be production ready. Um, well, there's some gotchas with that method, depending on how you configure those liveness and readiness probes uh, and how deep they go. Are they surface level? Like is, does the uh, web server respond or uh, status of internal application components, things of that nature. This article uh, is pretty interesting. It goes into some of the gotchas there and what you might want to look at, what's important to, to make sure you're you're checking out when you go through that route. So not going to go into any more detail, but uh, take a look and read on your own time if that's interesting to you. Next is Cuddle, the Kubernetes test tool. Uh, so this is an interest I actually found, I think it was like July of last year and just hadn't had a chance to talk about it, I don't think. But if you've done any development around Kubernetes controllers or operators, you've probably gotten to the point of like, I need to do some type of testing for this and figured out that it's kind of complicated. Um, if you use something like Builder, uh, they give you some frameworks and some tooling to help with some of the te testing there, but it's still a little cumbersome and awkward depending on what kind of tests you want to do, um, you know, for full functional end-to-end -end testing type. So Cuddle is a, a utility, a CLI that, that helps um, essentially orchestrate a lot of the pieces for you for testing your controller operator um, and basically where you can configure it and define your testing through YAML like we do almost everything else in Kubernetes. So um, pretty interesting tool. Uh, next up, we have MirrorD or Mirrored. Um, and this was reminiscent of some other... Um, kind of tool chains for local Kubernetes development. Um, but basically when you get into doing local testing, you know, before you commit to a, a repo and kick off your CI jobs and your pipelines and things like that, um, you wanna be able to do some, some checking on your local machine. And sometimes your applications or your platform or whatever you're building uh, have to talk to other like cloud services. So, you know, you might have a, a database or, or something like that running in your uh, public cloud environment that your application is dependent on to talk to you. Um, well, this tool um, helps kind of replicate some of those things. So if you have a staging environment and your cloud provider set up with these like data services and things of that nature, um, there's a piece that gets deployed into your actual cloud environment and then a piece, kind of an agent that runs on your local machine. Uh, and those two pieces talk to each other to help simulate and uh, tunnel traffic to some of those services um, so that you can get the full effect of having the entire ecosystem that your application depends on running on your local machine without having to deploy and go through the full orchestration of getting your workload actually running in the cloud before you can test it. So kind of cool. Um, next, the Ingress Monitor Controller. Uh, so this was an interesting thing. Um, from the folks at Stakeator um, that they've, they've done a lot of really cool automation around Kubernetes in the past. So not surprising to see this is from them. But essentially, this is an operator that can run in your Kubernetes controller and watch your like ingresses and, and whatnot um, to automatically configure upstream resources in one or more of these uh, resources, whether it's Grafana, um, Application Insights, um, Uptime, uh, Status Cake, Uptime Robot all these things. So basically it's dynamic. It watches your environment and creates these things for you. So every time you deploy a new ingress in Kubernetes, it can automatically configure something in Grafana to like start monitoring that and watching that. So pretty slick. Um, and then last but not least here, this is just an interesting article that kind of aligned with a lot of conversations I've, I've heard in and around the community um uh and 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 experience firsthand too where like some of the most successful shops that i've worked in uh started to look at your platform as a as a product or with a product mindset um and a lot of that um at its core is thinking about your 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 users as as your customers whether that's internal customers like your development teams or external customers as like true big c customers um and and using feedback loops to get like feature um, enhancements, roadmaps, and, and things like that. But um, it's if you haven't kind of thought about this before, it's a really interesting read. It can be a big paradigm shift for your team uh, or your company. Um, highly, highly suggest that. Um, again, firsthand experience where that's just been awesome. Great, great time to work. And, and we had a great platform because of it. So now I'm going to check the chat here. Um, I don't see any posts in the chat for job posting, so we'll skip over reading that stuff out. 
again, if you do have any type of job postings, feel free to continue to post in the chat. If you have them, um, I'll sync up with people in the room later. And again, we will have those available in our meetup notes um, on HackMD and GitHub that you can check out later on. All that being said, I'm going to shut up now and let you uh, listen to people that you probably really want to listen to. Um, so up first, we have uh, JP, I believe, um, who is a founder at Pipekit.io. And uh, he's going to talk to us, uh, give us an intro to Argo workflows for CI data and machine learning infrastructure. All right. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate the introduction. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, can everyone see that? Also, I don't know if I can hear y'all in the audience. So I think I'm getting some thumbs up. If someone could chime in on the chat and let me know um, that everything's working. You can working. see your screen for sure. Um, All right. Oops. Oops, wrong button. Love that. Now we're going full screen. Cool. So this is going to be Don't an intro hearing. to... All right, now I'm hearing feedback. Cool, and it's gone. All right, cool. So this is going to be an intro to Argo workflows for CI, data, ML infrastructure, all that good stuff. Um, could I get a quick show of hands? Um, who has heard of Argo workflows? One second, One second. JP, we're working, working on audio, audio real quick. quick. <laughs> All right. It was uh, going through the speakers originally. Yeah, I believe so. Just check your output device. Uh, or you're, are you, you're still dialed in? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think you did. Did you turn down the volume to the room when I was talking? Yeah. Okay. We have them. Sure. Extra. Test. 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 <laughs> JP, can you say something? Check one, two. Check one, two. Test one, two, three. Okay, JP, I think you are good to go. All right. Rock and roll. Um, I will start from the top. So my name is JP Zivilich. I'm the uh, CTO founder of Pipekit. Uh, and today we're going to be doing an intro to Argo workflows for CI data and ml infrastructure All right so again i'm jp uh i'm an atlanta native um prior to pipekit uh i worked at docker where i was one of the maintainers of docker hub and i'm an, also a contributor to the argo workflows project <clears throat> you can find me on linkedin at linkedin slash you know jp zivilich i know my last name is like hard to spell but uh there it is written and uh there's my github handle um yeah, so could I get a quick show of hands? Who here has heard of Argo workflows before? All right, I see a couple hands. Has anyone here used it? Keep your hands raised if so. Ah, right, cool. I'm seeing some some hands. So this will be this will be fun. Good mix of uh, hands up versus not. So what is Argo workflows? This is for the people who didn't raise their hands. So Argo is a 2012 American historical drama thriller film directed, produced by, and starring Ben Affleck. Again, I can't really hear uh, y'all's audio, so I'm not quite sure if that joke landed or not, but I think that's a pretty good movie and a decent joke. I liked Alan Arkin in the role. It was good. But in all seriousness, what is Argo Workflows? Argo Workflows is an open source container native workflow engine. Um, it orchestrates parallel jobs, simple to complex workflows on Kubernetes. Uh, it provides a declarative way to define those workflows and manage the dependencies in between tasks. And it supports both DAG and step-based workflows. Uh, you might have heard of uh, comparable tools like uh, Airflow, Luigi, Uzi. Um, these are all workflow orchestrators, um, but none of them were built with Kubernetes in mind. In fact, it's pretty complicated uh, to jerry-rig some of those systems to use Kubernetes. Um, whereas Arca Workflows was built from the ground up with Kubernetes in mind, each step is going to be running inside of a container so inside of a pod, and it uses all of the same Kubernetes primitives that you <clears throat> are familiar with. Cool. So let's talk a bit about uh, some of the use cases. So what would you use it for? Uh, data processing pipelines is uh, going to be uh, a big uh, use case. That was the core purpose for Argo Workflows' uh, original creation. Uh, so if you're going to be building some sort of end-to-end -end data processing pipeline, 
such as like ETL. Um, you want to run some like analytics um, and you just have a large scale of data that you need Kubernetes level processing power for. This is really going to suit your needs for that. Um, similar to that, machine learning workflows. So if you want to orchestrate uh, some ML model training, uh, do LLMs because that's hip and cool right now and probably will be for a while. Um, Argo workflows is a great option as well because of the high scale nature of it. Um, CI CD automation, again, this was not the original use case of Argo workflows, but uh, the use uh, exploded within the CI front in particular. Uh, as a, a trade off compared to like Jenkins or other comparable tools, Argo workflows is uh, pretty lightweight. And again, since every step is running inside of a container, it makes it so that running your tests, um, doing any other sort of like CI automation uh, becomes a lot easier and more scalable. So, and then lastly, infrastructure automation. So we run our nightly Terraform apply using Argo workflows. Uh, that's really nice because it makes makes it so that uh, we're always sure what the state of our cloud infrastructure is. We have that nightly uh, reconciliation happening. So I've included a couple examples. I know the text is a little small, um, but if you're interested in getting these examples, I'll go through some of them live like later in the talk, um, but I'll also be happy to uh, like share this slide deck uh, with everyone. But we've got examples in some of our uh, conference talks. So uh, usually there's an ArgoCon uh, at the beginning of every KubeCon as a day zero, and we've given talks on data processing, uh, machine learning, CI as well. So uh, go check those out. Now let's talk about a couple industry specific use cases. Um, so we work with several customers across like a, a variety of uh, different industries. Some uh, examples that we see are bioinformatics. So a lot of people are doing gene therapy research, drug discovery, um, kind of things within that uh, like bio realm using Argo because you have to just process like a large amount of data in order to get uh, like relevant results. Kind of similar is true for algorithmic trading. Um, so we work with certain uh, like algorithmic trading desks where they're trying to analyze uh, returns over like a set period of time and then um, run these uh, like models on them uh, to make like these short-term uh, like high frequency trades. Um, we find that one to be uh, pretty interesting because of the quick iteration cycle. Energy is a big use case as well. Uh, so we work with a company called Acure Battery or Acure Battery Analytics, and they do uh, analysis on batteries. So pr prior to working with them, I didn't know that um, batteries are susceptible to uh, like exploding or catching fire. Um, if you're if you followed along like the news about um, not being able to bring like certain Samsung like Galaxy phones. Uh, on like flights, this was an example of that, but it does happen at larger scales as well, uh, where like sometimes like city buses will catch fire and things like that. So batteries, if not maintained properly and not analyzed, um, you know, do present that bit of a risk. But one of our customers, Acure, uh, takes a bunch of uh, real time like battery data, uh, crunches the numbers and runs uh, like statistical models on the um, like batteries themselves to determine when are the times when it is most likely that the batteries are going to fail and fail in a hazardous manner. Uh, so I think that one's pretty cool. Uh, grid planning is another um, uh, like use case and also energy price hedging. Financial research, uh, again, similar to algorithmic trading, where if you want to compute the historic returns, create models, you can do that. And then sports, um, uh, a lot of the like major sports leagues uh, within the United States uh, use Argo workflows uh, to aggregate like statistics. Uh, both on the players and also the uh, like users who are watching the sports. Um, I think some of the uh, analytics that uh, were crunched using Argo workflows uh, led to some of the changes that got made to the formats of certain uh, major sports, uh, which is pretty cool to think about. Cool. <clears throat> so let's dive into how Argo workflows works. Um, so. Argo workflows uh, involves a user creating a workflow manifest. This workflow manifest is a custom resource definition. So you're going to be writing uh, like a YAML declaration and then submitting it to etcd. Uh, mm -hmm. So this gets stored uh, within etcd. And once it is there, the workflow controller, uh, which is a deployment, is going to take that manifest and start uh, working on it. So the controller then asks the Kubernetes API to create a bunch of pods. 
um, as you can see over here, and it orchestrates what's happening within the pods uh, during the, the workflow lifecycle. Then the controller is running like a uh, reconciliation loop where it's continually asking the Kubernetes API for the status of these pods. And then lastly, the controller writes the status and the parameter values of each workflow back to the workflow manifest. So within the manifest, which I'll show in a bit, um, we have both the spec field, which is where you define the specification, how the workflow is going to be shaped, how it's going to look. And then there is a status field, uh, which is going to chronicle what the actual like status of the individual pods composed or comprising that workflow uh, are. So that's similar to what you might find, uh, you know, on a pod itself or uh, a deployment. You often have like the spec where you're defining what you expect uh, like Kubernetes to do and then the status, which is the actual status that plays out. Any quick questions on how Argo Workflows works? All right, again, I can't really see or hear that well. I don't see anything in the chat. So I will keep this party rocking. So uh, if you're interested in trying Argo Workflows out in your organization, you might ask like, hey, how can I install Argo Workflows? There are three ways. Uh, so the first and the most common one that people do is they go to the Argo Workflows documentation or the repo and they see a quick start and they install it. I would highly recommend not following this path uh, because the quick start uh, installs like the latest dev install. Uh, Thank you, Joe, for posting that in the chat. Um, so in the uh, quick start, it installs the latest dev install. So whatever is the latest uh, like commit uh, on Argo workflows. So there could be uh, like potentially some buggy code or some like experimental code uh, that made it in. Uh, Argo workflows follows like a semantic versioning release process. So I would much, uh, I, I would I would suggest that you use the uh, like official release manifest or the Helm chart. And I'll go over those in just a second. So Argo Workflow supports both a cluster-wide and a namespace scoped install. So in the namespace scoped install, you would pick a single Kubernetes namespace. So let's say you have a namespace called Argo, uh, and you would install everything in the Argo namespace. And the only way uh, that workflows could run would be within the Argo namespace. Now, if we install the cluster wide, we could still install the uh, workflow controller and the Argo server, which are the two deployments that are uh, that make up Argo workflows within an Argo namespace. But we could submit uh, Argo workflows to other namespaces within the cluster. Uh, we often recommend the cluster wide uh, install. Uh, we've seen many of our customers and other people in the community do things like. Um, creating a namespace per uh, customer that they have, or if they have a dev team, creating a namespace for everyone on that dev team to have a nice clean namespace in which they can develop in and not um, you know, bump up against anyone else's work. And then additionally, we also recommend using a GitOps tool like Argo CD or Flux if you're doing a prod deploy. Um, so next I'll get into uh, the installations and I'll actually pull up this repo and we'll go through an example if I can get out of this view. All right. So now let me go to Argo workflows within the project. So this is the Argo workflows home repo. Uh, you might uh, like come in and say like, hey, let me uh, like try this. I think you get sorted into the quick start here. Again, avoid this. Uh, if you're looking to do the install, I'd recommend you coming over here to releases, clicking on releases. You can find the latest release and then scroll down and you will find the actual uh, like install. Here it is. Um, so I'd recommend using this uh, install again versus the any of these quick starts that you're going to find here. These are just, uh, I don't know, a little less secure. I think these are actually scoped for the release, but it's better to use the uh, install. So the install is going to install a cluster scoped installation and the namespace uh, install will install a namespace scoped installation. Uh, and the rest are like binaries uh, that you can get for the CLI. Um, so yeah, 
Also, another thing, if you're looking to check out Argo workflows and you don't want to install anything, let's say you're like, hey, I don't, I don't even want to install it on uh, like Minikube or Docker desktop. There is some interactive training material in this killer code, of course, uh, that we help maintain at Pipekit. Um, so come and check this out. What this is going to do is install an Argo workflows instance, like in your browser, or it's not in your browser, it's in a remote location that your browser is accessing, uh, and it's free. So go check that out. It's pretty awesome. Um, you can just play around with it, see if you like, uh, like working with Argo workflows. We also did a bit of the, um, what's it, the, the documentation on this as well. So I'm pretty proud of it. It does have a walkthrough of how to install Argo workflows, both using uh, like a traditional path and then also using Helm. Uh, so whatever you prefer, whether it's customized or Helm, uh, there's going to be instructions on how to do so. And then uh, I'd also recommend you check out uh, at the pipe kit, uh, like GitHub, we have this Argo workflow CI example. And this is a, a pretty production ready uh, like version of Argo workflows. So if we go into Bootstrap, uh, this is using Argo CD to stand up Argo Workflows itself. Uh, so we use uh, an app of apps pattern. Um, but if we go into Argo Workflows, we have a customization file. Uh, and you can uh, basically just clone this uh, repo down, uh, get started using Argo Workflows, even if you don't want to use Argo CD or Flux or whatever uh, to stand it up in a production environment, this customization path is pretty helpful. It, it'll install the latest uh, like Argo uh, workflows uh, manifest here. And we'll also add a couple other things. So it'll add an ingress. This is great if you want to set up that ingress uh, for production in your company. It'll put a couple uh, good role bindings in there uh, and set up a Minio instance, which is good if you want to do some like data processing and you need that object storage. Uh, we patched some nice things in the config map and the server deployment. Um, so this is going to be a, a really nice uh, like install. That would be good if you want to try this out at your company. Uh, let's see into the slides. All right. Get back to sharing. So next thing. All right. So next bit, uh, now that we've covered what Argo Workflows is, how to install it, um, the question is, like, how do I actually like run workflows? Like, how do I submit these? So there are two ways of declaring Argo workflows. Um, or I guess there, there might be more, but there are two main ways of declaring Argo workflows. The first and most common is going to be YAML. Um, so it's going to be a YAML definition similar to what you're used to uh, with declaring like a Kubernetes deployment, service, ingress. Um, it's a custom resource definition of type uh, workflow. So you can write the workflow and then uh, use the Argo CLI to submit. You can use the kube uh, uh, control, you know, the Kubernetes CLI uh, to apply. Um, we also provide a pipe kit uh, uh, CLI if you uh, are using our pipe kit managed service for Argo workflows. Uh, there is a UI, there is a uh, RESTful API that you can use uh, as well. You'll have to submit it as JSON, um, but YAML is just JSON under the hood, right? Uh, Argo events is another side project or is another project within the Argo uh, umbrella that allows you to set up event sensors, like listening to an S3 bucket um, or listening to uh, like Git, uh, and that will create a workflow that way. Or you can use PipeKit, uh, which is uh, our shameless plug for the managed service that we created for Argo workflows. Uh, we help with automating things like um, creating uh, your GitHub or GitLab uh, like integrations with Argo workflows. So if you want to launch a workflow in a CI workflow um, and you want to have it uh, like update the status checks for GitHub, GitLab, you can use PipeKit for that. Also, there is a Python SDK because data scientists hate YAML. Uh, it's called Hera and it is was created by um, Flavio Vadon from Dino Therapeutics and is also maintained by Bloomberg. Uh, so despite having a relatively no, low number of uh, like GitHub stars because it changed repos a little while ago, it is maintained by uh, like pretty impactful companies and is not uh, like going anywhere. So let me get into uh, some quick, or actually I'll just go back. 
to the slides. So with the Python uh, Hera SDK, there's a couple different ways of submitting it. Um, within this example, it shows uh, you would call this w.create or workflow.create. You're going to have to configure a couple things uh, uh, behind the scenes, but what it's doing is then querying uh, the Argo Workflows API. So you'll need to have that API uh, to be accessible. So if you've put the API behind a VPN, you got to make sure that you've got uh, like VPN access. You can also do this in a GitOps manner if you are using Argo CD with the Argo CD Lovely plugin. Uh, that's something that uh, our team maintains and we think is pretty awesome. And then lastly, uh, PipeKit does provide some convenience methods uh, with our own PipeKit Python SDK for submitting error workflows. And I will go through that in just a minute. Um, let's go through some examples of what these uh, workflows look like when we are submitting them though. So here I've got a uh, examples folder. Uh, so you can go to github.com slash PipeKit slash examples and pull up all of these examples. Uh, and we think they're pretty great. Um, so you can come through them. These are ones that we know are going to work uh, like with PipeKit and I've stood up a um, like an example Argo workflows using one of our like virtual cluster environments and we are going to rock and roll through that. Cool. Um, so here is the Argo workflows uh, UI. Um, so I've, again, I've stood this up, uh, like within one of our environments. Um, but if you follow the instructions for, uh, like doing the customizer, the helm install, it's going to look, uh, much the same. So we're going to take, uh, this example for a DAG here that's going to run a diamond shaped DAG. So the first step is going to run, uh, the A step, and then we're going to run two steps in parallel, and then we're going to run a final step that runs only when the two parallel tasks complete. Pardon. So this is going to be similar to like a map reduce, uh, like type functionality where we want to run like a, like let's say uh, an extract, and then we want to run like a bunch of like transforms or something like that. And then at the end, uh, we want to like aggregate everything and like load it uh, somewhere. So if we look at the actual uh, like YAML definition, here's what it looks like, right? So. Again, if you're familiar with CRDs, uh, like this probably isn't too scary. It looks a lot like, you know, how you would declare um, like a deployment or something like that. Um, so we have what are called templates, and these are the fundamental unit of work within Argo workflows. There are two principal types of templates. One are called work templates, and the other are called orchestration templates. Work templates are... Uh, items that do individual bits of work, uh, such as like running a container, um, creating a Kubernetes deployment, and there's a couple others, um, but those are the two principal ones. And then orchestration templates are usually like DAG or steps that are orchestrating other templates to figure out how you like shape your DAG or uh, like run your linear steps. So within this, we have two uh, templates. The first is the DAG definition. So this defines the four steps that we want to run and the dependencies that each one has. So from that diamond shape we saw earlier, we've got the A step that's going to run first without any dependencies. B is going to run only when A is completed. C is going to run in parallel to B only when A is completed. And then D runs when B and C are done. And GitHub is really liking highlighting things when I click. Um, and then we see within these tasks, uh, we define the template that it wants to invoke. And it's going to invoke the same template every time. So that is just an echo template. It's going to run an Alpine uh, 319 container, uh, allocate you know, the request limits uh, for that. And it's just going to run an echo uh, like CLI command. So in each time, it'll echo a parameter that gets passed in under the name message, and the value is changing each time. So it'll just echo A, B, C, and D. And we will see that in the logs. So um, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show how to submit this thing. So I've got this repo cloned down locally. And let me adjust it so I can see without the Zoom controls interfering. All 
right. I'll just go back because we made this repo nice and friendly and just included the submit command at the bottom, which I love. Um, so this is using the uh, pipekit submit command. Again, I know that's our uh, like custom managed service. Shameless plug. Um, you can do the same thing with just an Argo vanilla uh, submit or uh, like a kube uh, control apply. Um, I'm doing it with the pipe kit one because again, this is a virtual cluster that I'm submitting to behind our VPN. I want to make sure that it works in a secure fashion. So we're going to run it. And then I'm going to go back into the Argo workflows UI. And I'm going to refresh the page because I don't know why the WebSocket died, but it was not alive. And we can see a workflow is running and we can see the status of each of the steps within these workflow. Uh, so the A step ran, the B and C, it looks like they ran in parallel pretty quickly. And then the D step is running. And we can see the logs uh, for the workflow itself. The A, uh, it looks like C completed before B did, and then D at the end. Looks like I got a ch uh, question in the chat. Uh, what is a DAG? Is that terminology in Argo workflows? Good question. So DAG stands for Directed Acyclic Graph. Um, and that is more of like a, a computer science term. Um, so it, it means a um, a series of nodes that are connected in a linear fashion uh, where there is no uh, circular references happening. So think of like Git is actually a DAG under the hood, right? There's that first commit that you make, it can branch off and it can come back to the, the main branch or whatever you're calling the default branch. Um, and then uh, the only thing you can't do is like write some sort of like loop within uh, like Git or within that tag. Uh, VJ, did that explain it clearly? If not, I'm happy to go in more depth. Thank you, Joe, for including the link there uh, to the Wikipedia. All right. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it. Um, cool. So again, that's how you submit an Arca workflow. There, I'd recommend checking out uh, like all the examples, but you can get some some really cool stuff happening uh, beyond just like these uh, like DAGs. Let me see if I can quickly submit like a uh, a Git example here. I might have to just go into a different view. Go into defaults. Yeah, here's like a fan in, fan out pattern that's referring to like a bunch of artifacts. And as you can see, this can get like kind of complicated. Um, really, I'm just trying to show like the sky is the limit as far as what you can do here. You can um, build your Docker images uh, like in this these pipelines. So let's say you want to run um, like Canico or uh, I think we use BuildKit internally within an individual step. You can do that and uh, get things going that way. Um, if y'all have any more questions, again, uh, like throw them in the chat as far as YAML. I'm going to quickly show how to do this within Python as well. Um, so quickly, I'll go into a Jupyter Notebook environment. Uh, we've installed like the uh, PipeKit SDK and done our auth. Here's uh, the definition of a similar workflow, but written within Python. Uh, so this is going to be a coin flip. Um, um, workflow. So it's going to run uh, like a flip that does a random number generator. Um, I think if uh, it's equal to zero, then it's going to return heads. If it's one, then it's tails. Or maybe I'm reading that Python wrong. I don't know. Python's not my strong suit. But what you'll see is cool is that we can define the uh, Kubernetes resources within uh, the actual Python code as well, as long, uh, including the Docker image. So for each step, if we wanted to run different Docker images, let's say incompatible versions of Python, or we wanted to do something like stand up a Spark application or a Dask deployment uh, for even greater parallel processing, we can do things like that. Um, really anything that you can do in Kubernetes, you now have the ability to do uh, like within a Python script uh, declaration. And we're finding that data scientists like really enjoy this uh, almost as much as they complain about um, YAML, which, you know, is a lot. So quickly, I've ran the cell within the Jupyter Notebook. Now I'm going to submit it. 
uh, to the cluster. I think I submitted it within the Argo namespace. And I did. And here we're going to see the coin flip happening live. Um, so we can follow it along. One thing, or I'll, I'll point this out when I'm done, when this is done executing. Let's take a look. So we can double click so on. Um, Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, were you sharing the Jupyter Notebook? We're not seeing the Jupyter Notebook right now. Uh, let me uh, pull let it up. Me pull it, up. Uh, it looks like uh, I was not. Like I was Good, not. Call. Good call. All right. All right. So there's no feedback, so I'll leave it unmuted. <laughs> That's what I was trying to do. Can you all see that now? Can you all see that now? Yes. Yeah, uh, now we can see it. Cool. I am getting a little bit of feedback on my end, but whatever. I can, I can ride with I can, it. I can ride with it. Um, so here's the Jupyter um, so notebook. Here's the Jupyter notebook. I guess that means y'all didn't, didn't see the um, original YAML submit original either. YAML did, you submit either. did you see this on iTerm? No. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Here's what, uh, here's what uh, submitting an Argo submitting workflow an Argo through the CLI through the looks CLI. like. My apologies, like, I didn't get to see that. Most of it was in the browser. Looks good. Looks great, JP. Thanks, y'all. Thank Thank um, um, let's pop into let's the Jupyter Notebook. Any questions, Any on, questions this? on this? On the Jupyter Notebook. On the Jupyter Notebook. Also, it is a nice thing. Also, it is a nice thing. It's so cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> The Jupyter Notebook, the, Jupyter the Python, notebook makes a lot more Python sense. makes a lot more sense? Yeah, now that we're, because like we were just seeing the containers pop up, like heads and tails. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, I'm so sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah, sorry, guys. Thanks. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for pointing thank, out. Thank you for pointing out. Yeah. Uh, so like, do you, have you encountered any teams that are super tied to like Airflow and CBT and things like that? And how does this integrate with those? Yeah, or, so, yeah, so it is normally a trade-off between, trade between Airflow and, and um, um, using Argo using and, Argo and Hera. Hera. Uh, we have found um, there are some found there are companies that use both companies that in, tandem, in tandem, but Argo but and Argo uh, this Python uh, SDK can, can, can just be a total replacement for, uh, for Airflow. Uh, Airflow. Cool. Also, I am also, getting I am enough feedback, getting to, make enough feedback to make it a difficult little difficult talk. Is there any way we can turn me down? Can turn me down? Yep. Working on other shirt Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you, Joe. I appreciate you, Joe. <laughs> um, cool. Let me hop back in um, to the UI. Now I can't hear you all at all. Um, which means I can't hear the feedback, so pros and cons. Um, but I'll jump into uh, the UI. Uh, so this shows the full CRD for like the completed workflow run. And kind of, as I mentioned earlier, we've got the spec, which is what we declared going in. Here's what it looks like, uh, like the output of that Python in YAML. Um, and we can go to the status where we get the full on status of the workflow. And this is what's reconciling uh, within Kubernetes. Um, so that is, it's pretty interesting. This is, uh, something that we often analyze for our customers, uh, to figure out like what's breaking within their workflows. Um, cool. Let me go back. I got something in the chat. Wanted to know more about the Terraform, uh, you used. Uh, so the Terraform we use is creating just two Kubernetes clusters, um, with the cluster autoscaler enabled, uh, like on EKS, I think we use spot instances, uh, like pretty heavily. Um, but I can go within like our SAS product and let's see if I can pull up like the nightly Terraform deal. Also, let me know if you can't see uh, a browser right now. It's not just setting up the test environment. It's actually setting up like a prod uh, like Terraform or like our prod infrastructure and our staging and test, but it does everything. Uh, we haven't implemented search. It's always fun. Hey, JP. Love you. Can you hear us? Yep. yep. I can hear you. I can hear you now. 
Uh, did you end up writing a, a custom plugin for Terraform, or do you inject it into a container and run the container on each run for the Terraform? The latter. The so latter. Here, so here is the build the for the actual for the Terraform, actual container. Terraform container. Um, so we're running <laughs> so like a, we're running cron, like a cron workflow, which we'll get, into in, which I'll get into in just a minute. That builds that uh, like builds, a container uh, like that, a is, container going that run, is going um, to run um, uh, the Terraform. Uh, the Terraform. So it runs so Monday it runs through Friday. Monday through Friday. So the last question, because I always have questions, is if somebody deletes like a VM in there, will the ter will Argo automatically see that, and then Terraform will go back and re-instantiate the VM, or what is Ter? Do you see what I'm asking? Uh, I I, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. So for us, so we're for only us, using we're Terraform only using to provision the cluster. cluster. And then everything yeah. and then that, everything lives, on that the lives on the cluster. Oh, uh, so pushed like, after, uh, yeah, I see. RFID, yeah. yeah. Everything, yeah, it's RFID. Everything, yeah, it's RFID. Yeah. So I, that's yeah. what yeah. I generally what recommend. what I generally recommend. But, you know, but, every, you know every, company every, is every company is different. Um, also, um, again, also, I'm getting again, a lot of feedback. I'm getting a lot of feedback from me. Um, I have um, one other question. So you, you mentioned yes. using spot instances heavily. Um, what? Uh, how does Argo? If Argo, if one of the instances running an Argo workflow task gets preempted, how how are people dealing with? Like, is there a strategy to deal with that? Um, like as far as retries and things like that, how how sort of complex is the the uh, the capability there? Man, y'all are uh, asking, good uh, asking good questions. Good questions. So there is a retry strategy, and I just missed it in the docs. Um, there's a couple different things that you can do. So you can set the retry strategy here, uh, like within a, a given uh, like template. Um, or you can set it uh, on the like default layer, which if we got time, I, I can cover later. Um, so you can set the retry strategy here to like a certain amount. So if the node gets like um, you know uh, preempted or uh, you know just randomly shut down on a spot instance, you can handle handle it there. For something that's more of a long running task, um, you can also set a like a node selector um, and say like, hey, we're only going to schedule this. Um, let's say more uh, like sensitive uh, type task on a node that is in a spot instance that we are confident is going to be around. So something that is more like mission critical and we can't deal with it uh, just being on like a single spot instance that Amazon is going to steal from us uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, we would do that with a, a node selector, but it's a, it's kind of a, a dual prong strategy. It's something again, like you know, uh, this like random number generator. We probably don't care if it gets killed. So we'll schedule this on like spot instances and just uh, define like a sensible retry strategy. But something like, um, I don't know, uh, like a long running job that is like processing, um, you know, a, a bunch of um, like big data where you're like, it would be expensive for me to rerun this task it would be better to uh, just provision a longer lived node and then uh, use the node selector feature here. Did that answer the question? For the question. Yeah. Maybe, all right. Maybe. All right. Uh, let me get into two other quick items before I wrap up. So, um, one item is how do you write dry or do not repeat yourself workflows? Um, so there is a concept within Argo workflows called a workflow template. Um, it is uh, like poorly named, right? We have the template, but a workflow template is just a workflow that lives in a given cluster and um, can be invoked by another workflow. Um, so the workflow template is confined to a single namespace and the cluster workflow template can be invoked in any namespace. Um, and this is good if you have something that you're doing a lot of times. So if you, um, let's say, want to always run this like post to Slack, uh, like bit of a workflow, that would be a good candidate for putting in a workflow template, similar to like a pager duty uh, type like update as well. Let me see if I can pull up 
an example template. Right, here we go. So here is what they look like. They're very similar to workflows and you can refer to them uh, like within a workflow itself using a template ref keyword. I'd recommend checking out the docs and playing it with it for a little bit. Uh, and then last item before I wrap this one up, uh, cron workflow is what it sounds like if you're familiar with cron. Um, so cron is like a scheduling tool um, and uh, a cron workflow just combines an Argo workflow uh, with a scheduling logic. So here within the spec, we've got some additional scheduling logic um, and that just sits on top of the normal uh, workflow. So for that example that we had earlier about the uh, like Terraform, uh, like nightly build, we have a cron uh, schedule that we have declared. And let's see if I can just pull up an example here. And so again, here's what it looks like. This is an example of something that's going to run every five minutes. Um, and it's just going to run this, this cron workflow over and over. But again, good for consistent tasks. I think I'm pretty close to time. Um, so I, if we have time for a q and happy to take it. Um, and if not, um, if you're on the CNCF Slack, you can find me at, uh, at JP Zivilich, um, or JPZ13 on GitHub. Um, yeah, if, uh, I'll stick around for a couple minutes. Uh, you can ping me in the like chat as well. I'm happy to, uh, like exchange emails or, uh, whatever, whatever works for y'all. Um, but thank you guys so much for attending. Uh, this was super fun getting to chat with y'all and sorry about some of the Zoom sharing difficulties. Uh, we got through it together. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, I've unmuted. So JB, can you hear us? Yep. Yep. Q&A. Got one from VJ. That one from VJ. Um, uh, Thanks, JP. Useful session. What are some of the use cases that the workflows, workflows can solve? Can solve. Do, you Do you have hands on experience with them? That is a good question. Uh, let me share my screen again to go to one of our ArgoCon talks. I might have a link here. Um, so if you go to uh, github.com slash pipekit uh, slash talk demos, um, there with under the ArgoCon demos folder, uh, I gave a, a talk at ArgoCon this past year of how to train an LLM with Argo workflows and Hera. Uh, so we have the full YouTube recording uh, like here. And then we also have all of the sample code. Uh, so you can work through that sample code uh, if you like. And it'll actually walk you through how to take, um, I think Llama 2 was the foundation model that we trained. And we trained it on a, another uh, like set of data. So this is an example of where you can take uh, like a, a foundation model. So we'd recommend starting with some base model um, just because training from scratch is like prohibitively expensive. And then injecting it uh, or training it with data uh, that you want to do for your specific use case. So let's say uh, you're working on like a healthcare app, you would um, train it with like things specific to uh, the field of healthcare uh, that you want the LLM to have experience with. We got another question here, JP. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm, um, I'm using Git, GitLab uh, for, for my CI CD. Uh, yep. Can this completely replace my, my my pipeline? Can you work together, or is is that something? How would that work? Yeah. So I think the answer is both. Uh, you could entirely replace your GitLab uh, CI with Argo workflows. Uh, so we run all of our CI internally uh, with Argo. Again, I'll share uh, what we've got going on at PipeKit. Hopefully, I don't share anything sensitive. Probably won't. Um, like that. Um, yep. Yeah, so okay. yep. everything but runs in a container. Containers and... I'm sorry, Ms. J. Could you repeat that? Could you repeat that? So, so it'll build the the, the the containers. I uh, if you tell it to. Uh, if you so tell it to. So. Let me go into the code that we have for ourselves internally. So this is our internal CI. And 
let me i spelled build wrong that's always fun um so here's the step where we're actually building the container uh for each of our services um so we're running a build kit um don't get scared by all of the options we're specifying uh art and for guy uh likes to get really aggressive with the caching and multi-platform builds um, but this can look a lot simpler um but what we're doing is within one of these workflows, uh, building uh, each of the containers images for our microservices. And this happens on every CI run. Um, what's nice is we do use all of the, the fancy caching within BuildKit. So uh, like the container builds are like almost instant whenever we push a CI job. Uh, and that's, that's pretty great. Like it's nice to be able to push and the tests do take a little bit uh, long. I think sometimes they can take like I don't know, four minutes or something like that. But the actual image builds are are pretty lightning quick. I can't hear if someone is speaking, by the way. And, and is there like a, a certain language or, or like I think that that's in bash. Uh, is, is there like a certain language you need to use or for the matter? So it's going to so be whatever, be whatever language, language the container image container supports. Image so for uh, the movie build, build kit image, it expects, it expects bash. bash. Um, bash. Um, but let's say you have a container image that uh, can build a uh, can build an image within that container, but accepts Python within the command. You could use uh, like Python down here. Or any other language. Or any other so language. think about it. So think like about base it. Image like the base image includes the includes language the and any dependencies. dependencies. And then the command step, the command here, step here includes whatever code, includes whatever code whatever in whatever language, whatever language is included with in the base image. I got a question I got in the chat, a question in the chat for, DJ, for deploying for the ML models with direct models to direct Argo CD, CD or Argo Workflows. Work um, I think it depends on your setup. Uh, some of our customers use Argo CD for deploying models. Uh, some deploy them uh, just using normal microservices. Uh, some use a tool like KServe, uh, which is a dedicated ML model serving package that came out of Kubeflow. Um, I think uh, you know, all of these can be great tools and it really depends on what works for your organization. Thank you, Vijay. Thank Appreciate you, Vijay. It. Appreciate it. Cool. I don't, I don't think we have any more questions, questions in the room. JP. All, all right. Thank you. Thank you so all much. Right. Good job, JP. Thanks y'all for having me. I really appreciate it. It was fun chatting with you. It was fun chatting with you. I wish I could get some pizza. I wish I could get some pizza. <laughs> <laughs> next time, next time. We'll send some to Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all. Hi, JP. Thank you, Sunit. We'll get Sean set up here for, uh, what's the topic? Kubernetes Gateway API. Kubernetes Gateway API versus Ingress API. Um, so if you guys want to grab another drink or something, come right back. Uh, all right, next time we'll get the AV stuff figured out. Their tech support didn't show up, so. <laughs> it's working right now. Sean, do you want to come up here? Do you guys want to refresh your beverages? Yeah.
Can uh, everybody on the video here? I think we're ready to get back started again. Okay, cool. Awesome. I think we're ready to get started again. So, uh, and uh, we confer people can hear us on the video. So, if anybody on the if everybody online can just put their questions in the chat, that way we want to the audience. Okay. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the uh, Kubernetes Gateway API. Um, this is kind of an introduction and a primer um, on that. Um, whoops. I skipped ahead of uh, slide. So, hi, my name's Sean. Um, I am uh, one of the founding engineers at Speedscale, and uh, a lot of my job involves uh, working on our sidecar proxy and uh, dealing with all of the nasty network stuff that nobody else wants to touch, uh, which is why we have stickers that say, give me a PCAP somewhere around here. I don't know. It's on there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And he reads a PCAP without wire. <laughs> <laughs> it's called it's called it's called T Shark, and you can use it on the command line. Um, well, my, we know you use a hex editor. <laughs> I, I do, I do. Um, uh, so that's that's just a little bit about me and what I do. Uh, um, just as a disclaimer, this is really kind of a broad overview uh, because the if you're not familiar with it, the Gateway API is relatively new. Uh, it has been announced as generally available since October, um, so new-ish, right? Um, but considering how versions change and things like that, you know, it's probably going to be deprecated in a year, right? So, um, so uh, let me go over at least some basics on you know what what this is and what I'm really talking about. So you might already know about the Kubernetes ingress API, or you may have heard about it before. So what, what exactly is that? Well, the Kubernetes uh, ingress API uh, is, is an API for controlling and managing how external clients request in cluster resources. So basically think of it like an edge router where you want some requests to come in and be routed to a specific pod or selection of pods or workload or thing like things like that. Um, it's declarative routing uh, for HTTP and HTTPS traffic endpoints. We'll just call it uh, a layer seven software defined networking, uh, if you will, um, or SDN, if you if you know, you know the term. Um, the implementations for Ingress API um, are different. They're, you can go with a lot of different Ingress uh, implementations. Um, most people are probably familiar with the Nginx in ingress controller. You've probably heard of that one. Um, but generally speaking, those will support things like load balancing, TLS termination, uh, and virtual host routing, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, it, it, it's just a really nice, flexible way to, to get requests into the... Sorry, am I talking too loud? No. Okay. Uh, it's a nice declarative way for getting requests into your cluster and to the workloads that need to um, handle them, um, which is great if you're a person who uses, you know, GitOps or something like that, where you can keep everything sort of version controlled in, in that in that route. Um, it, it is a specification; it's not an implementation. Like I've, I've said, implementation, and you know, as far as Nginx goes. Um, it is a it is a definition for how ingress controllers, which are the actual implementation, should behave, and they fulfill the request based off of whatever the declaration specifies. Um, and it, it's it's a pretty robust landscape. It's been around for a while now. It's been GA since one dot nineteen, um, and like I said, you've probably heard of things like the Nginx um, ingress controller Kong. HA proxy, things like that are pretty well respected and used uh, across the ecosystem. 
so what what is it what does the ingress look like if you if you're not familiar with it well it's it's you know yaml like we all have seen with anything with kubernetes related this is i basically just copied and pasted this from their documentation so i don't know what it does um but uh you get something like this you define an ingress route uh you, you, you uh, the the ingress specification will uh, define rules based off of what sort of protocol you're trying to route, and you can do path routing and things like that where you send it to a specific backend or something along those lines. So say that you have an API that is slash, you know, like shopping cart or something like that. There's a specific shopping cart microservice that you have. You route it based off of the path of slash cart. And you go to the the workload that you need to to go to, um, but it's old news. Like anything else that we work with, it's uh, deprecated or not really deprecated. Uh, it, it's old news. But so what's going on? Why is it old news? Well, the Ingress API went GA, like I said, in Kubernetes one point nineteen. And what are we up to? One point twenty eight now is the release. 29? Okay, so yeah. Uh, so we're quite a quite a distance away from 1.19. Um, but more specifically is that this particular API is now considered frozen and no longer receives any feature additions. Um, so we've all heard that before. What do I do now? Um, if I'm if the thing that I'm relying on to route traffic to the workloads, my cluster is no longer um is no longer getting feature additions well um this is where the new gateway api comes in um so what exactly is it well uh it's a bit of a successor to the ingress api okay um whereas the ingress api was primarily focused on doing layer 7 routing for http and tls traffic things like that grpc um, the Gateway API extends that to focus more um, about how you might think about network routing with a service mesh. So it's layer four and layer seven routing um, and a lot more flexible in that regard. So it's not just limited to just HTTP routing. You can do T TCP routing, um, anything like that at the, at, at the layer four uh, for network traffic. Um, you get the same capabilities as you do with uh, ingress API. Uh, you get load balancing, mm -hmm. TLS termination, things like that. So it's kind of in the same vein. Um, the One of the big differences is that uh, if you read on documentation, sort of the the why they did this uh, was they, they make a lot of uh, effort to focus on that, that this is a role-oriented uh, sort of API implementation. Um, and it's based on personas. Um, so, and I'll, and I'll get into that in, in just a second, but it, it's based on personas that we all know, or maybe we are one of these personas, infrastructure owners, somebody who is operating the actual cluster itself, cluster admins, people who are responsible for, you know, just maintaining the, maintaining the uptime of the cluster, developers, basically all in, uh, all across this spectrum of, of people, uh, there is something within this API that uh, satisfies a need that they might have, um, whether it's route definitions or uh, defining certain classes that that the implementation might need, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, like I said, don't think of it really as kind of a, a like a replacement for the Ingress API. It's more of an extension of the Ingress API. It's Ingress API on steroids, if you will. So you get a lot of the stuff that you get with Ingress API with more, uh, more things. Um, so personas. What 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 do I mean by personas? Well, um, in 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 terms of the multiple layers that you might see uh, within uh, a, a, like an infrastructure definition for a gateway uh, routing sort of thing, uh, there are different people or different personas that might be interested in different portions of it. So gateway class is kind of the, uh, call it the the raw implementation here. Um, you, you, if you're familiar with the Ingress API, Ingress API, 
this is basically the same thing as an ingress class. It's, it's the raw implementation that you might see or definition of what is going to provide that ingress routing. Uh, the gateway is, is the definition of the edge routing itself. So it's collection of different route definitions, TLS routes, TLS rules, TCP routing, everything that is within that, it is sort of like the top level thing. Think of it like kind of the namespace for all of the networking routing definitions you might have. Um, and below that, you have the, the things that most of us are probably more concerned about is the actual routing definitions themselves. So how do I get my um, service to respond to specific requests if I'm not the one who is responsible for maintaining the load balancer or something like that. Well, that's where you get things like this HTTP route, TLS route, TCP route, UDP route, uh, things like that. So all of that can operate completely independently from people who are providing the infrastructure and people who are maintaining the infrastructure, which is actually pretty nice. When you say infrastructure, you could say like AWS, TCP, like that, or is it, are you referring to something else when you say infrastructure? Um, I, I mean, more of like the, like, it, it's more of like the specific implementation, not necessarily the protocol. Okay. It, it's more of like, is it, you know, Kong or, okay. or is it AWS or uh, something along those lines. So um, a perfect example of how this might be something that um, would be more an infrastructure thing is uh, service definition, Kubernetes. Load balancer is, unless you're using like metal LB or something like that, it's all an infrastructure um, uh, implementation. So AWS, GCP, they all provision out your um, uh, load balancer IP addresses automatically if you define it as load balancer. Um, it's the same same sort of thing. Good. So, the, so like you said, it down to our like ingress API is a spec, it's not an implementation. Right. This is also a spec, not implementation. That's correct, yes. Uh, can, can you do your, your, your network policies on here or is that still going on, on, on the technical systems that I get? Um, you can, I, um, I think you can do both. And I like sort of like, um, I think Cilium is one that has like a, a, like a cooperation with this gateway API. And I'll mention this in, in a minute. Um, there, there's the, the landscape as far as implementations is, is growing but it's not as mature as say like the ingress API uh, landscape might be used to. If we upgrade to you know, No, um, from, from what I've seen, it's not, it's not being deprecated anytime soon. Um, and I'll mention this uh, a little bit later, but um, it's not going away. So there, there are reasons that you may want to switch to something like this, and there may be reasons that you don't want to switch to something like this. Um, and that that's kind of depending on uh, what your needs are. Uh, you know what uh, what kind of network routing um, capabilities you require. Um, and Ingress API might be something that's just fine, right? The layer four thing is like super. What's that? The layer four thing is awesome. Like, it's a total pain in the neck. It, it, the new absolutely, four. yeah. And it's it's been one of those things that that people move to. Um, the, the only way you get it is you go to like a service mesh where you get Envoy and you get all of the complexities that come with that. Um, but you also get that flexibility of defining all of the layer four rules that you want to define, which is really really nice. You know, if you're if you're a networking guy. Um, um, or if, you know, networking is your sort of thing, but you don't get it with the Ingress API. You just get like HTTP or gRPC and call it a day. Yeah. In, in this picture here, if I'm, let's say, the application developer looking at the TLS route, it, are these components that Celium or Nginx would need to implement all and then expose for me? Or what's the, the breakdown of those? Um, so the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, because they are because the uh, the gateway API is more of a, a spec in terms of what a implementation should provide in terms of I'm declaring a certain resource and I want it to do this. 
then the implementation specific details should be left up to whoever does it. Either it's Cilium or it's HA proxy or something along those lines. Somebody is going to take this declarative information and turn that into the right kind of networking rules that need to happen at either layer four or layer seven for it to function correctly. Good. Okay. So, um, I probably already covered this, so maybe you already know this. Um, maybe you're using a service mesh, Istio or something similar to that. Well, um, Istio is something that I have to touch a lot because a lot of people use it. Um, so I have to get used to working with and around Istio and how um, their networking operations work. Um, and Istio is pretty dependent on uh, Envoy. And if you're not familiar with Envoy, it's a layer four proxy that was developed at yeah. Lyft. Thank you. Yes, I was going to say Uber. I knew that was wrong. Um, and uh, <laughs> I knew it was wrong. Um, and uh, it, it, is, uh, it is frustratingly difficult to uh, configure sometimes. Uh, if you ever had to dig into Envoy configurations, like really get into Envoy configurations, it's not fun. Um, so, so, so yeah, uh, uh, Istio, Istio, uh, Istio with Envoy uh, uses Envoy as a sidecar proxy and it configures uh, Envoy to do all the routing that you want it to do um, at the layer that you want it to do it. Um, so if you go through the Istio documentation, you'll see a lot of things that are very similar to the gateway API. Um, you'll see things like TCP route, you'll see things like virtual host, you'll see things like TLS route or TLS rules, things like that. It's a very, very similar concept, um, but now it's more of like a standardized thing in, in, instead of a, like an implementation specific thing. So um, again, Istio, you get a lot of these SDN concepts that I've mentioned, virtual services, ingress, egress rules. Uh, and layer four and layer seven routing, which is which is nice. Um, so back to uh, gateway API. Like I said, it's role oriented. Role oriented. The aim here is that it attempts to model how an organization or software organization actually works. Right. You have your team of infrastructure operators that manages the infrastructure. You have your uh, your operations people that manage. Um, you know when things get deployed to the cluster or manage upgrades to the cluster, things like that. The, um, the, the API definitions mean to sort of uh, enrich that and, and, and um, make that something that's more, you know, something you rely upon um, as you're working through it. Um, portable, again, these, the, the, these top level terms are something that's directly from their documentation. This is what they describe it as. I'm just paraphrasing a little bit here. Uh, portable. Like I said, it's a spec, not an implementation. Um, there's a lot of, uh, 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 I'll give a perfect example, uh, Python. Python is not necessarily a language definition, it's a spec for language, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you have multiple different implementations of Python. It's the same sort of thing, right? Um, it, it's expressive. You get, uh, like I've mentioned before, you get very flexible SDN mechanisms that you may need. Header matching, uh, route matching, uh, TCP uh, port or, I, or destination matching, things like that. Those are the things that you're going to want to, um, th th that you're wanting when you're looking at something like this. Um, and it's extensible. Uh, as with anything, you can define custom resources against it. You can extend it however you might want to if you're an implementer or something like this. Um, and that's just, that goes right into the ecosystem with Kubernetes for anything. You get your custom resource definitions and go to town. Um, like I said, asterisk, uh, directly from the documentation. Um, so what really is it good for? Well, uh, north, north, south traffic routing. This is probably what you, um, whether you know the term or not, this is what you get with the ingress API, north, south. Uh, traffic routing, meaning external to internal your cluster, um, you get that broad level exposure with 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 this API. Same thing with ingress, right? Um, the extension to that is not only do you get just the north south 
routing capabilities, but you also get the ability to do in cluster routing as well. So um, for any of your applications that are sitting behind your edge gateway um, within the cluster, maybe you want to define specific rules based off of certain traffic patterns where you might be rolling something out or you want to do a canary release or something like that. You can define custom routing rules based off of certain endpoints. Say you've got a new endpoint for an API that uh, is going to be exposed to external clients, but you want to start you know, eating your own dog food before you expose to everybody. You can define in-cluster rules for that kind of routing um, or, or whatever you need. Um, uh, so it's 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 really good for something like that if that's um, something that you need to worry about. Um, and of course, this is just a couple of things, but think of the um, the broad ecosystem of software defined networking and how you can sort of um, route things based off of the rules that may be different per application or per circumstance. And uh, this this allows you a lot of those opportunities to to go and do that. Um, so there, there are some core concepts that that fit into this uh, gateway API that I think if you're familiar with Ingress API, you would be familiar with. Uh, gateway is uh, the sort of core definition. Think of it sort of like the namespace for all of your uh, network uh, routing rules, things like that. Um, you might think of that similar to an ingress definition where you get, um, you know, um, like the slide that I showed earlier where you have an ingress definition and you have HTTP routes where you say this particular path goes to this workload, something along those lines, same sort of concept, except it's called a gateway. Um, a gateway class um, is very similar to an ingress class. Um, this is more or less the specific implementation of what is going to facilitate the routing um, that you are requesting. Do I? Uh, yeah, it's, it sounds, VJ says, it sounds like it does overlap with some Istio features like in cluster intra service communication. Is that right? Yes, it does. Um, it, it, it does in the sense that um, you get a lot of the same kind of routing rules that you do with Istio. Um, and if Istio or any other service mesh is something that already suits your needs, then there may not be any uh, need for you to use something like the Gateway API or an implementation of the Gateway API. You might just be fine with using Istio if in your cluster as it is right now. Um, which I, I, I'd say probably, you know, getting off the ground with Istio by itself is a big enough of a hurdle um, to get it operating in a cluster and configured properly that if it's working for you, then then just stick with it. It's, it's probably fine. Um, but this is meant to be more of a uh, Kubernetes generic um, answer to how service meshes have have sort of filled that gap of where ingress API um, has not solved certain categories of problems. So do you know, like, so we were just looking in like the OpenShift implementation is this the, um, do you know what some of the other implementations are? For, uh, for, gateway. for gateway API, um, there's a couple and most of them are like beta, Currently, and I think I have a hold on. Let me Cilium. Um, where is it? Um, Envoy has a, a beta implementation. Istio has a beta implementation. Kong. Uh, th there's there's several different main players in the ecosystem with with respect to um, service routing and and network routing that have started to adopt this. Um, and even though the, the gateway API itself is announced as being generally available, the support for it is still sort of beta and experimental, right? So because it's so new and-, and there's, not like a, there's not like a reference implementation is there on the like in terms of Istio right now. Like Istio I think is pretty much, yeah, what people have kind of, A lot of the concept and terminology is is almost one for one with how Istio works, right? So it's 
if, if you're familiar with Istio, then it's going to be very familiar within that ecosystem because um, you get a lot of the same functionality. You get TCP routes, you get TLS routes, you get I mean, virtual ship systems. Much nicer. Like every time I go to use Istio, I, can, I forget what the CRDs are called. Yeah. I can't figure out how to write the rules. Yeah, it's, 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 way it's basically a rendered yeah. service mesh had been out for a while and lots of people have seen lots of different implementations. They said, we did some things right. We did some things wrong. Let's come together and like make this a little bit. Better. Yeah, but, th that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah, this is very clean. Very similar. Yeah, it's that that's that's a better way of saying what I what I, what I said. But yes, it's it's um it's a more we learned some lessons uh, from all of the service mesh implementations, this problems that they were trying to solve, and now we're going to sort of unify this into one sort of specification. So you don't have to worry about I am running Istio in this cluster, but I'm running this other service mesh in this other cluster, and now all of my networking rules don't translate. So um, it's good for that. Did, did you? Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Do you think cloud providers are going to take advantage of this new API spec? How do you see that? Uh, they will probably move at the speed of business. Um, it, it'll probably be available, I don't know, at some point. Um, I, I think the way that it looks right now, at least the landscape that I've seen, it, it's it's going to be a, you need to install whatever is going to be providing this in your cluster specifically. Now, I'm sure you'll probably get an offering from Amazon or you know Google that you can add and you know install an add-on to EKS or you know whatever. Uh, but I haven't seen anything about that unless anybody else has. Um, yeah, I mean it's it, it's just GA as of last October. So uh, can the uh, question is, can gateway replace ingress or is it supposed to be used in conjunction with ingress? Uh, the answer is it can replace it. Um, I keep clicking out of this window. Zoom is terrible. Um, it, it can replace it. Um, and there are reasons that you may want to replace it. And there, there are reasons that you probably don't want to replace it. And I'll cover a couple of those in a minute. Um, but it is, it is a, think of it more as a more flexible, more robust um, extension of the Ingress API. It's not necessarily um, uh, something that you want to use both. You probably just want to use one. Um, because if you're getting the benefits that you need out of the Ingress API and you don't need uh, any of the layer four things or any of the extensibility, stuff like that, then there's no reason to switch. Um, if you do, and you're already using a service mesh or you're considering a service mesh, then this may be something you want to look into. Um, so, because the questions have been coming up, can or should I use this? Yes, you should, maybe. But why? When would you want to use the extrinsic? I'm sorry? When would I want to choose the gateway API over service? I mean, I get layer four and things like that over service. What are the additional features like the add ons? Um, so with, with the service definition, you don't get the, th there's, there's a lot more granularity that you can get with something like this that you don't get with the service API. Um, so with a service definition, you're matching workloads to the externally exposed service. This one you can route and load balance and get a lot more flexibility on how you want to um, get traffic to specific work workloads. So maybe you want to load balance between 80% on this workload and 20% on this to do like kind of like a canary sort of thing. Or maybe you want to have this function more like an API gateway in the sense that you have one centralized endpoint and multiple different microservices that will handle different um, uh, uh, URL paths or something like that. Something that you wouldn't normally get with just like service definition. Um, so um, gateway, the API adoption, like I said, the, the Ingress API is sort of old news. It's not going away, but they're not adding anything new to it. They're not going to change the definitions. They're not going to modify it. It's sort of frozen where it is right now. So you can think of this as more or less Ingress V2. Um, it's not necessarily a complete replacement. Call it an extension. Call it we learned some lessons along the way, and now we want something that takes Ingress API makes a little bit better. Um, 
like I said, the 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 general availability was announced in October, um, and the landscape of the implementations is already relatively broad. You get your name, uh, major players out there, Cilium, Envoy, Istio, Kong. There's several others that if on the documentation page for the Gateway API, they actually list a whole bunch of them and their status as far as whether or not they're beta or they're GA or some other status. Um, so this is this is kind of, I think, what we've been touching on, at least for the what the questions have been touching on, is reasons you might want to avoid this, for now at least is that many of the implementations, like I said, are still in beta. Some of them are generally available, but the majority of them are still beta. And if running beta software in production is not something that you are particularly fond of, then maybe stay away from it. Um, but you know that's, that's just gonna come with the territory with anything else, right? Um, the... Integrations with service service meshes, specifically service meshes, are listed as being still experimental um, because of the um, overlap that you get between the resource definitions and um, take Istio, for example. The resource definitions that you would have with the Gateway API versus the resource definitions you would have with Istio, there's a lot of overlap there. So interoperability is going to be something that really needs to be an Istio problem they sort out. Um, and that is still considered experimental, at least according to, you know, the, the, the documentation here um, for the Gateway API. So if you're not too jazzed up about, you know, um, using something that's considered experimental in production, maybe not for you. Um, Maybe it's not something that you want to do if the Ingress API is 100%. It suits your needs for right now. You only need to do just layer 7 routing at HTTP, and that's it, and it is solving all your problems. Then there's no reason to really worry about it, right? It's not going, in a way, uh, going away anytime soon. You can just stick with what you've got. Um, and that follows into the next point that I have here, is that you only really need to do HTTP routing. You don't need complex layer 4 routing or TLS termination rules, things like that. Nginx, uh, the Nginx controller, ingress controller is, is perfectly suiting your needs. Um, and some features um, with the Gateway API are only available uh, via experimental channels. Um, some of those involve some of the layer four rules that I've mentioned, so like UDP routing, um, that's something that I think is only available with experimental channels, uh, things like that. So if you want something that's more, um, has had a little bit more um, um, production like runtime, um, then maybe stay away from it right now and maybe wait it out and see how it goes for people. Maybe they fix a few things or um, make some specification changes or things like that. So, um, Again, that, that, that's kind of a 10,000 foot overview of it. Um, getting started with it is really more or less about, um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, brushing up on documentation. Um, if you're not familiar with the Ingress API, um, then learning a little bit about that. But um, all of the documentation you can find about it is on the, um, it's just gateway-api.sigs.cates.io. Um, which is a very easily rememberable, uh, rememberable URL. Um, and there is a community around it if you want to get involved or ask questions about it. I think that there's uh, probably a Slack, like a community Slack on there uh, on the, the contributing page. Um, but the docs are a pretty good place to go for uh, a little bit more of an in-depth uh, detail um, about the, the different mechanisms and things like that. I just covered some of the basics of it. Again, think of it more of like an extension to the Ingress API more than anything else. Yeah. Well, well, well they, they, they understand that it also can replace the services as well. I don't know if you would necessarily want to replace services. You could, um, but you may not want to because services in their own right have their own benefits in the sense that uh, you get, you know, in cluster DNS with that uh, um, and um, within conjunction with things like readiness probes and things like that, you sort of 
know that your availability behind the surface is going to be um, better than than without it, right? You're not talking to pods directly. So I would say that probably the combination of the two makes for something a little bit more powerful than one without the other. Um, I would probably not get rid of services because I, I like having that um, abstraction layer between um, the endpoint that I want to expose versus the actual you know, replica sets or things that I'm running behind the scenes. Um, so I, I would probably use both of them. Um, that, that's, that's kind of all that I have. Um, how long I've been going? So I guess there's time for any other questions or anything like that. Hey, Elden, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> Good. Oh. It has been a minute. Yeah. I guess what is the most resounding situation that you've seen where it was like, yes, gateway API is the answer here. Um the 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 times that I've seen this where it it has absolutely been something that solves a problem is anytime that I'm going to try to solve to say like I need um so I'll give you a perfect perfect example. Okay. Um so our um the the speed scale uh sidecar that we have is all layer four and anything that operates at layer seven from a routing standpoint it, it i can't use i have to work specifically at layer four and then i'd make determinations on where things need to happen or what happens at layer four so in that particular instance layer four routing is really something that's important to me um it also means that you can um you can take something that is a non HTTP based service and 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 sort of yeah you know, uh, blue balance it exactly yeah 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 thank you yeah um, so if you're operating you know a, a MySQL cluster or Redis or whatever you can sort of expose that at the TCP level not necessarily HTTP level that you wouldn't get with the Ingress API so again it, it goes right into that category of problems that service meshes solved right and why they sort of came to exist um i don't think that you get the mutual tls stuff that you get with service meshes uh, but that's another pro that you get with using service meshes mutual tls out of the box and call it a day right but that's also a complexity you adopt it's, again I, yeah yeah <laughs> <They're right. laughs> yeah like I, I think i think about it in the way that Think if if your pod API, your replica set API, and your service API were all developed by different entities, how crazy that would be. Mm -hmm. Like you have to have all of them to have a running service, running application, but they all look and feel different and, and whatnot. Um, so it's a similar way if you think ingress, uh, service mesh, API gateway, mm -hmm. like all of those things should kind of work together in tandem, um, but the implementations are all over the place. There's tons and tons of options for all of them and they all have their own APIs and they all look and feel very different. So I think this is like bringing that, like what can we distill down this sort of universe work across all the implementations and put in a yeah. work together to make an API that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, I think a lot of it, um, if if you're familiar with Istio, a lot of it follows along with Istio because I think Istio is kind of one the whole service mesh thing, right? There's sort of you know I think a lot of people sort of lean towards that. Um, so the terminology there rep, like follows a lot of that, and um, yeah, across a lot of Linkerd out there. You know? yeah, <laughs> it's 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 on there. I think that there's some Linkerd support as as far as the API gateway goes, um, or the yeah, gateway. Like yeah. Step one is install service mesh. Then you'll get mutual TLS and all that stuff. Right. Anyway, and step two is put the gateway API on top. Yeah. Then it's a bit nicer way to do service mesh. Right. You don't yeah. have to remember what a destination call is. Right. And it's it, it's it's nice in it's nice with the flexibility and, and the portability that you have. It's like you you know, okay, we we don't want to use Istio anymore, but we have all of our, these network definitions that are Istio specific. Now we can adopt them at a general you know, high level standpoint, and we can switch implementations relatively easy. Um, if you, if you, those of you that have been around the community for a while, if you remember the uh, uh, like uh, open service.
service mesh interface yeah. that Microsoft and a group of people were doing that kind of failed and didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. This is the real thing of that. No, no, I, they, they started it I, and, and they weren't wrong for starting it. They, yeah. they just didn't get the uptick. They didn't get the other people like bought in on it, like Gateway API and, and Gamma have had like all of the big names, you know, uh, from, from cloud providers to like service mesh implementers and whatnot that yeah. behind it. So it's, it's got the weight for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So there's a couple questions in the chat. Um, would you... Uh, you would pick the gateway of choice and deploy uh, like you would deploy your choice of ingress control, like Nginx. Yes, that that that's uh, that's what you do. And configure gateway class uh, so developers can start creating gateway rules. Yes, that that is that's what the, I know. You guys can't see the question, so I'm reading them out. Um, another question from VJ on the the chat is: Can the gateway do auth in or auth c currently or coming in the future? Um, or does it depend on the choice of gateway you go with? I would imagine, um, I'd imagine it probably depends on the gateway you go with. And I don't know if there's a specific specification within the API for doing auth and auth C, something like that. Um, um, I didn't see anything, uh, but I could be proven wrong. So I couldn't tell you for sure. Any other questions? I have a comment, which yes. I think, you know, is there's one thing that you kind of like mentioned in that answer, which kind of feels like an extra challenge to me. It's like as we're adding these additional APIs, we're adapt adopting this initial additional complexity. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels a lot of the the there are benefits, but then there are also drawbacks. You know, now anytime you want to say you're, you know, a, a Stone Age man and you're trying to install your first Kubernetes cluster via Kubernetes the hard way, you know, used to be, you just, you know, didn't have to choose, you know, a, a, a networking provider. You didn't have to choose a CSI, mm -hmm. you know, Kubernetes is kind of like farming out for more and more GA um, interfaces, the actual implementation. Right. And yeah. like, I think that it's, an open question in my mind of how how much benefit are we getting from these like super configurable you right. know implementations when we're also adopting the complexity of like having to choose potentially a lot of different vendors you know right. like look at something like flannel you know it's like been around forever people use it like Somebody maintains it. I don't know who's like, <laughs> it's still there, you know. But yes, I think it's I think it got adopted as a CNCF. They were like, yeah, come on, like you guys, you too. <laughs> but like, yeah, I mean it's it's I think it's a real question of like how much as as somebody who's you know operated a cluster, you know, it's like how much complexity are we adopting as we're adding these i mean even with the nginx yeah. stuff you know you had to like and now you have to choose like is it the nginx plus or like you yeah. know am i pulling my containers from russia you know <laughs> right yeah so no you're right uh there's i mean there, there's a trade-off for sure uh because a, a, like a lot of these things especially within the ecosystem right now it's more about the framework definition, not necessarily the implementation definition, right? So it's it's become more of a um, a rubric for providing something, not necessarily providing that implementation itself. And you know, with this you know particular instance, say auth or let's see, it kind of conflates the 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 notion of how do I deal with cluster wide network routing versus how do I deal with per service authorization, right? So um, yeah, you're just gonna just add just add another thing to your list of stuff you gotta maintain, and that's that's what you gotta. Like another big drawback we're still working on projects and uh, for Edge and the client wanted to put something in the I don't remember what were the final numbers? Do you remember? It was like it added a whole four and then mm -hmm. another like couple gigs or something. Yeah. To get a full control plane out there. 
And it was, it, you know, like kind of broke them off, you know. And I think, but on the other hand, like, if you're going to do control plane and all that stuff anyway, like, oh, it's so nice to have like a community API instead. It, it is. But you're going to always have to have the ingress for people that don't want to put a whole bunch of extra pods right sidecars and stuff yeah um yeah it, it, there's 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 definitely gonna be some overhead for sure um i think this probably opens the opportunity for maybe uh lower overhead solutions as compared to something as big as a service mesh i mean you open the door for istio and you get a lot you know it, there's a lot that it can do um and you may not need more than you know 10 percent of that right um, and maybe you only need the specifics of just doing um, TLS terminations or pass through, um, or you need TCP routing. Um, you don't need mutual TLS, even though you know everybody starts to use it or or whatever. Um, but yeah, you 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 can you can look at options with this where there might not be the overhead that you might have with something that's you know like Istio or something like that. And there there are some like. If Follow the Istio project. There's the ambient mesh um, mm. side of things, which is a sidecar version of Istio. That's the eBPF one. Uh, it has some eBPF in it yep. for sure, but they have like wait, waypoint proxies and Z tunnels that are more like like a node level proxy, right? Um, or a proxy as a thread, uh, yep. sort of thing. Uh, so you you reduce the overhead of the sidecars uh, a good bit, and that's. A lot of the stuff that they're doing with Ambient is aligning with the, the gateway API mm -hmm. uh, and to the point that like talks are like, do they even have an Istio specific API for some of the features, or is it just only, only like gateway. launches with with um, gateway API? Yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Which come back next month because we have some items that we talk about you see an ambient mesh so yeah. <laughs> I'm asking that what the give you a PCAP sticker that's pretty cool Oh yeah okay so if you want if you want the sticker that says get me a PCAP it's because I say it all the time um you, there's over there probably cooler help yourself that's my um, trademark yeah. And if there's no other questions, I'll see anyone in the chat. Um, we can hang around for a little bit here in the room and do some social time, but I'll just do a quick wrap up. Um, so, Sean, thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. Um, thank you again to the Speed Scale team for uh, helping coordinate things with the HPC uh, physical thing. It's great to be back in person. So, uh, thanks everybody for showing up. A um, couple of housekeeping items. If there's a topic that you would like to see presented um, or a topic that you want to present, um, let us know. Um, you can tell me in person. Um, we have a ACL at gmail.com. We have a Git repository. Everything's on the case ACL. Um, you can stay up with the lecture. Yeah, sure. Um, you can tweet us, text us, email us, uh, open a PR, whatever you need to do. Uh, to let us know. Uh, we especially love to have people in our own community here uh, present, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a beginner level topic or an advanced topic. It doesn't specifically have to be Kubernetes. It can be Kubernetes adjacent. Um, so it could be a process or a procedure or a thing that you're doing in your own place, uh, in your own organization, um, or just something you tinker with as a hobby at, at night or on the weekends or anything like that. Um, otherwise, we're just going to pick what we like and track down speakers to find it and whatnot. So we would we would like to have your input in that. Um, so please let us know if there's a topic that's near and dear to your heart that we can reach out to people and line up speakers for. Um, outside of that, we do have a speaker lined up for next month. As I said, uh, tentatively, the date is the twenty. Is it the twenty second? Right. Yeah, February twenty second should be a Thursday. Um, yeah, yeah. So February twenty second, hopefully back here at ATDC. We're still working that out, but we'll post in the normal channels uh, if that changes or whatnot. But thanks everybody for coming out, both in person and online. And uh, that's it. I'm gonna stop the uh, meetup and the recording, uh, but we can hang around for a little bit and, and chat in here. So thanks everybody.
Yeah, I'm not sure about it.